Hello and welcome to an overview of the gross anatomy of the brain. Here we will consider the macroscopic uh, structure of the mammalian central nervous system with a special emphasis on the cerebral cortex of the human central nervous system. It is important to understand the structure and terminology of the CNS, uh, just as it's important to familiarize place names when reading a map of a strange country or territory which uh, is new to you. But more importantly, uh, any dysfunction of the brain, you know, gives us knowledge, you know, of how the brain actually works. So uh, there are very famous cases in history. Uh, one was Phineas Gage. He was an American railroad uh, construction foreman, and uh, he was stamping dynamite, you know, uh, making, uh, laying rail, uh, railway tracks. And there was an accident and the tamping rod uh, exploded and went straight up into the air and uh, th completely through his head. And it destroyed much of his brain's left frontal lobe and his behavior completely changed. He also lost his eye. Uh, if you can see the uh, uh, images on the extreme right, you can, uh, his skull has been preserved. And he, uh, you, know, you can see the rod uh, going through the skull. So pretty severe damage. However, he completely recovered. Uh, he could do his normal function, but his behavior changed. He was no longer gauge. He used to be a very uh, serious, reserved, church-going uh, man. But after his uh, accident, he became a very coarse individual. He started swearing, drinking, so on and so forth. He joined the circus in the end. So this uh, gave us the first clue, uh, formally you know, uh, recorded, uh, in history that uh, you could have dysfunction of this nature uh, and leaving the rest of the brain completely intact. And uh, another uh, physician who contributed uh, to localization of brain function was Pierre Paul Broca. And in eight patients who had difficulty in speaking, he did the postmortem uh, of their brains after they uh, died. And he found that there was a problem in a particular area of the brain. It was in the left side and in the inferior frontal lobe. This is called the frontal lobe and below. So he famously enunciated that we speak with the left hemisphere. So uh, that is why we need to know uh, brain fun uh, structure because it allows us to understand brain function. So before we get into it, uh, just like when you read a map, you have to know north, south, east, west, how to read the legends, so on and so forth. So similarly, you have some terms, most of them derived from Latin, uh, which we use as shorthand to uh, you know, communicate what exactly we're talking about. So uh, one set of terms is anterior, which is the front of the body, and posterior, which is behind. The other term is rostral, which is uh, towards the head, and caudal, which is the tail. Also, uh, dorsal, which is uh, towards the spine or ventral uh, towards the belly. So more terms of location uh, would be superior, which is on top or above, and inferior, which is below. Uh, remember, all vertebrates, including humans, have the same uh, basic body plan. They're largely bilaterally symmetrical. Okay. Uh, also, you have lateral, which is away from the midline. This is the midline, so away from the midline or medial, which is towards the midline. And plus you have distal, which is uh, uh, like the palms or the soles of your feet, and proximal, which is your thighs or your shoulders. So as far as planes are concerned, uh, this is just the uh, lateral view of the same. So you have three major kinds of planes uh, used uh, while describing uh, anatomical locations. So one is a transverse plane. This is just uh, a chop right horizontally through the body. Then you have the sagittal plane. Imagine a, a sheet uh, plane going right through your nose, through your forehead and right down. And then you have the coronal plane. Uh, people have a corona around their head, so it's going through your ears and right down. So these are the main planes and the coronal plane is also referred to as the frontal plane. Okay, okay so finally, uh, with that introduction, uh, with terms and stuff, we come to the central nervous system. So the central nervous system essentially consists of the brain and the spinal cord. And the brain consists of all the structures which are intracranial, which is inside the skull. 
So you have the cerebrum, which is mostly what people think of when they think of the brain, you know, the highly convoluted uh, gray matter, the surface of the brain. Then you have stuff which you don't normally see, which is hidden inside the midbrain. Uh, and uh, also you have the brain stem, uh, which consists of uh, structures called the pons and the medulla. And then behind you have uh, the cerebellum, which is uh, a small uh, brain uh, replicating many of the morphological features you see in the cerebrum, but uh, very different. Uh, EEG recordings uh, basically reflect activity from the surface, the cerebrum. So we will not focus too much on the deeper structures of the brain because this course uh, is basically focused on event-related potentials, what you record from the scalp, which senses the stuff on top. Uh, you also have the spinal cord, uh, which you know uh, is the continuation of the brainstem in the uh, vertebral canal, and this has four different uh, you know uh, divisions: the cervical division, the thoracic division, the lumbar division, the sacral division. We'll come to it later. So, as far as the deeper structures are concerned, if you want to really record from them electrical activity, you have to use MEG. Magnet, magneto uh, and cephalography where you record the magnetic field rather than the electrical field. But we are doing EEG, so we'll be uh, looking at stuff coming from the surface. Okay, so uh, the forebrain, the cerebrum, okay, is the site of higher mental function, you know, all our thinking, reasoning, all that stuff. And uh, the brain can be divided into forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. And uh, on this side, you see uh, a cross section, a coronal section, if you will, uh, of the a schematic of a mammalian brain. So the forebrain consists of two structures, the telencephalon, that is the two cerebral hemispheres and their interconnections, and the diencephalon, which is a structure within uh, the forebrain, uh, you know, covered by it, and it consists of the thalami, the thalamus on either side, and the hypothalamus. The, as mentioned uh, just now, the cerebrum is where the ERPs mostly arise. And the external surface of the uh, cerebrum can be usefully divided into lobes, poles. So you have the frontal pole or the frontal lobe, which is in front, uh, right behind your forehead. And this uh, is involved in high level processing, like controlling motor uh, activities, thinking, reasoning, the temporal lobes are below it, and they are involved in speech and language production, also memory, also emotion processing. Uh, above the temporal lobe is the parietal lobe, which deals with integration of different sensory information, uh, you know, uh, different uh, modalities of touch, of sound, of vision. Everything gets integrated over here uh, before it goes up for processing. And finally, behind you have the occipital uh, uh, lobe, which purely deals with uh, visual processing uh, from basic stimuli to complex uh, stimuli like faces. <clears throat> so, the, as you might have noticed, there are a lot of uh, infoldings, you know, and they're called uh, gyri, ridges, and sulci, which are grooves of the cerebral cortex. And this is caused during development and the reason why, and this is highly evolutionarily conserved, uh, this kind of structure where you have infolding uh, gyra and sulci, uh, this increases the surface area of the cerebral cortex, and thus the processing power of the uh, cerebrum. Uh, even though you have a confined activity in the, uh, I mean, confined space in the skull, uh, you know, the skull, you know, uh, limits the, you know, growth of the brain. So this is one trick uh, nature has used to increase the surface area. And uh, it is important to have an idea of the different uh, salsi and gyri, because even though you have uh, cool new techniques like intraoperative MRI, uh, this remains essential to plan for surgery uh, and you know learn anatomy. So let's talk about the fissures of the salsi. So looking at the brain from the top, you have two hemispheres. And there is, you know, a central uh, fissure uh, running right through a longitudinal fissure. So this is the longitudinal sul uh, sulcus. And um, 
If you look at it from the side, this is looking at the left side of the brain. Uh, you have a lateral uh, fissure or a lateral uh, sulcus. And uh, this longitudinal fissure separates the two hemispheres. The lateral fissure, there's one on each side obviously, it separates the parietal lobe and the temporal lobe. This and this. The central fissure separates the parietal lobe and the frontal lobe. Right? And then you have a parietal occipital sulcus which separates the parietal lobe from the occipital lobe. These have, they're named after anatomists, so the lateral sulcus is also called this fissure of Sylvius, and the central sulcus is called the fissure of Rolando. So now coming uh, to uh, the stuff on the medial surface of the brain. So if you took out the right hemisphere, we saw the two hemispheres uh, separated by the longitudinal fissure. So what happens when you uh, separate the two hemispheres and look at the inner surface of a hemisphere? So this is the uh, inside surface of the right hemisphere. And again, you have prominent uh, sulci over here. So you have uh, the collateral sul sulcus, which is below, which separates the fusiform gyrus from the hippocampal gyrus, and it's on the inferior surface of the temporal lobe. Then you have the parietal occipital sulcus, which as its name suggests, separates the parietal lobe from the occipital uh, uh, lobe. And then in the within the visual cortex, uh, you have a calcarine sulcus, which separates different parts of the uh, visual cortex. Now coming to gyri. So this was the sulcus, what we talked about. So the infolding uh, and the outfolding is the gyri. Uh, so you can think of mountains and valleys. Okay. Mountain peaks, valleys. So gyri are unique structures and uh, they're evolutionarily very significant because they increase the surface area of the brain massively without necessitating an increase in cranial capacity. So even though our skulls are, uh, you know, of a limited uh, capacity, uh, you have a massive surface area because of this uh, infolding of cortical tissue. And as we learned in the first session, uh, previous session, gyra are made up of gray matter and uh, they are, uh, nerve cells, bodies, dendrites, all of that structure. We'll get into more detail later, but they're made up, made up of neurons, interneurons and supporting, you know, uh, uh, axons. The size and layout of the gyra vary from person to person. Uh, no two brains are alike. Uh, however, gross features, this uh, you know, main, uh, the the macroscopic features remain constant and are useful to know. Uh, so these are this is important. Um, you have the central sulcus as previously described. This is the area before it. So it's a precentral gyrus, and this is the motor part of the brain. So all your motor activity uh, originates, uh, all your movements, finger movements, playing piano, you know, originates over here. Uh, your motor evoke potentials all originate over here. The post-central gyrus is the gyrus behind the central gyrus, and this is um, sensory. So all the sensory uh, part of the body, of the sensorium, uh, come over here. And this is where the somatosensory evoked potential, uh, you know, originates. And this is something you can record from the scalp. Uh, below the uh, frontal areas is the inferior frontal gyrus, which is found on the lateral surface. Uh, and it's involved in speech production, specifically an area called Broca's area. We encountered Pierre Paul Broca. So this was the area where he found in post-mortem there was a problem. Okay. And uh, this controls motor functions to do with speech. So you're able to articulate, uh, you know, words uh, because of uh, control from here. So uh, f other, uh, you know, uh, gyra and the lateral uh, surface of the brain. We're still at the lateral surface of the brain. So one is the superior parietal lobule and inferior parietal lobule. So these are gyra of the parietal cortex. And both these are in involved in integrating sensory information. And both these uh, contribute majorly to cognitive event-related potentials such as the P300, which we will encounter in subsequent lectures. And uh, the inferior parietal lobule also uh, it, it integrates sensory info and uh, the angular gyrus, which is a way it integrates um, visual info from the occipital cortex. Okay. So 
coming down, this is the superior temporal gyrus, it's on the lateral surface of the temporal lobe. This is the temporal lobe and this is the uh, superior temporal gyrus. So on the left side is the verniquet's area, uh, important for speech uh, language development. And uh, this also contributes to cognitive ERPs, uh, example mismatch negativity. So the superior temporal gyrus is found on the lateral surface of the temporal lobe. On the right is verniquet's area, uh, it's important for language development and for the comprehension of speech. Uh, both this whole area uh, contributes majorly to auditory event-related potentials, example, the mismatch negativity, which we shall encounter in subsequent sessions. So uh, continuing on, you have the middle temporal gyrus on the lateral surface of the uh, temporal lobe. So you have diverse cognitive processes, such as contemplating uh, distance, recognition of known faces, accessing word meaning while reading, all that stuff happens here. And then you have IT, infratemporal gyrus, which represents complex object features, you know, and uh, it's involved in global shape perception and number recognition. Then you have the transverse uh, temporal gyrus, Heschel's gyrus uh, over here. And uh, this is located on the superior surface of the temporal lobe. You can't really see it, you have to you know, lift it and peek in there. And this is the site generation of the auditory work potential. And you also have in the occipital uh, uh, area of the occipital lobe, superior, middle and inferior occipital gyri. And again, all this is to do with the visual system, uh, like face recognition, uh, as complex as face recognition to as simple as flashes of light. So the visual evoke potential arises from here. So coming to the medial surface, so uh, this, you know, you can't really record, uh, but, uh, you know, from the surface of the scalp. However, it's good to know what exists. Uh, so this is, uh, you've taken away the right hemisphere and you're looking at the in inner surface of the left hemisphere. So one major uh, gyrus over here is the cingulate gyrus, which uh, is a component of the limbic system that, uh, you know, processes emotion and also regulates aggressive behavior. And some uh, scientists have suggested with experimental data that uh, if there is an important place in the brain, which is a center for consciousness, an intracortical correlate of consciousness, if you will, the anterior cingulate uh, gyrus, uh, you know, is a, a very uh, important candidate. And then uh, coming to the back, uh, you have uh, the cuneus, which is, uh, you know, uh, its name, uh, named after its shape. And it's a part of the occipital the, uh, lobe and uh, thus involved with visual processing. And uh, finally, uh, when you, uh, I, if you remember uh, the lateral surface of the brain, in fact, uh, we should go back, this part. If you lift this area and, you know, expose what's inside, there is a huge enfolding. And uh, that is called the insula. And uh, this is concealed, if you will, uh, within the temporal lobe, and it has long and short gyri. Uh, it's not as well known in studies as the outer stuff for access reasons, but it's involved in uh, taste and uh, uh, aversive behavior. Uh, so on the inferior surface, you know, what's below? Now this you're not going to record at all from the uh, scalp. However, the important, uh, you know, uh, gyri over here, the lingual gyrus, it's a part of the occipital lobe, this, this part. And then you have the fusiform gyrus, which is next to it. And uh, the lingual gyrus is, you know, uh, important visual shape processing, while the fusiform gyrus is important, uh, involved in facial and word recognition. And then you have the parahippocampal gyrus, which uh, borders the hippocampus, and it's important in memory. The hippocampus is a structure inside uh, the brain, uh, uh, very important for memory. So then, uh, just for completion's sake, what's right inside? So right inside you have, uh, uh, you know, this structure in red, uh, the whole thing, it's called striatum. And it's a, a critical component of the reward system. Uh, uh, you know, what makes you happy, the pleasure centers, all that is over here. And it con uh, coordinates multiple aspects of cognition, including motor and action planning, decision making, motivation, reinforcement, reward perception, in all these different tasks and cognitive, uh, you know, uh, in all these tasks, the striatum is involved. 
The striatum can further be subdivided into the caudate nucleus and the lentiform nucleus. The lentiform nucleus, in turn, uh, is made up of a larger structure called the putamen and a smaller structure called the globus pallidus. So coming to the thalamus, again, uh, it's a central uh, midline uh, structure on both sides and uh, its activity is difficult to record from the scalp. It is a very important structure involved in both the sensory and motor functions of the brain and it's a part of the brain where sensory information from all over the body converges and then it's sent to various parts of the cortex. And what are its functions? It's a hub. It relays information between different subcortical areas in the cerebral cortex. Every sensory system except the olfactory, the sense of smell, uh, passes through the thalamus. And uh, its main function is to relay motor and sensory uh, signals to the cortex. It also regulates sleep, alertness and wakefulness. And uh, coming to the midbrain, so if you take a cross section of the brain, this is roughly this area over here. And now you're looking at it from the dorsal surface, uh, from the back. And uh, this lies in between the forebrain and the hindbrain, and uh, also called the diencephalon and the Roman cephalon. So it has two uh, dorsal elevations uh, called the colliculi. The whole thing is called the colliculi. These are the superior colliculi, they're above. And these are the inferior colliculi below, if you remember superior and inferior. So as a whole, it orients the head and eyes towards something seen or heard. The superior colliculus is visual and uh, it is a layered multi-sensory structure. It receives visual signals from the eye, but the lower uh, layers receive uh, signals from other brain areas. The inferior colliculus, on the other hand, is mainly auditory and it does signal integration, frequency recognition, and pitch discrimination. So, coming to the back, the hindbrain or the Roman cephalon. So, uh, coming to the back, the hindbrain or the Roman cephalon, uh, this consists of the pons, the cerebellum, and the medulla oblongata. So this is the pons, this is a uh, mid uh, section, uh, this is the uh, cerebellum, and this is the medulla. And this continues on as a spinal cord. So the pons is involved in the control of breathing, communication between different brain areas, and sensations such as hearing, taste, and balance. Uh, there are cranial nerves uh, which arise from the brain which uh, subserve important functions. And uh, uh, cranial nerves five to eight arise from the pons, and uh, their nuclei are over here. The cerebellum uh, contains 50% of the cells in the brain, um, and it's, it has its own uh, salsa and gyri, uh, you know, structure. And it has varied functions, some of which I feel are yet to be discovered. Uh, it is involved in balance, in motor activities, walking, standing, coordination of voluntary movements. And we know this because in uh, neurology, with patients who have uh, strokes or problems or tumors in the cerebellum, they have profound deficits in these activities. It also coordinates uh, muscular activity and speech and eye movements. And then finally, the medulla, this is kind of the involuntary center, which controls respiration, circulation, regulates breathing, heart and blood fu uh, vessel function, digestion, sneezing, swallowing, vomiting, all the stuff which are not directly under motor control occur over here. Then finally, the spinal cord. So the midbrain and hindbrain are collectively referred to as brainstem, which you saw in the previous slide. They continue through the neural, as a neural tube, through the foramen magnum. It's a big cavity at the base of the skull, as the spinal cord. So the spinal cord is about 45 to 50 centimeters and two centimeters in cross section. And uh, this is its cross sectional histological structure. Uh, it consists of a cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral parts. So there are seven cervical segments, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, and five sacral. So the spinal cord itself ends at the border of L1, okay, lumbar one. So all these different uh, vertebrae which are uh, below, uh, the spinal cord uh, ends much above them and it continues on as uh, a structure called the corda equina, you know, uh, horse's tail, consisting of uh, lumbar and sacral nutes of various nerves. The spinal cord itself ends at L1. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, this was kind of an introduction to um, uh, neuroscience, uh, the structural stuff, the terminology used, and also some information about 
a cellular structure. So uh, next uh, week we shall get into the, the meat of the course, which is electrophysiological recordings, neocortical circuits and the resting membrane potential with an RMP demo thrown in. Thank you very much.